Hi guys, and welcome to Piano and Keyboard Artist, where we discuss the artists related to pianos, keyboards, and synthesizers. And continuing with my Depeche Mode album review series, this is Violator Part 2. Hello to you, my friend, and it's good to see you again here on the Vaughan George channel. I want to thank you for all the positive and kind comments I got from the last week's video, which was part one of this series. I always knew that this was a very, very sought after series, um, but I was overwhelmed by not only the amount of comments and the amount of traffic I received for that video, but just the, the, the great vibe and the goodwill that came with this. Uh, it, it has surpassed my expectations, so thank you so much. It also dawned upon me, I was thinking about this album review series, and I thought to myself, if you're sitting there watching this, then you're indeed a hardcore Depeche Mode fan. The fact that you will be sitting through my videos, which are typically at least a half an hour long, and listening to details of things that you already know, proves to me that you are a fan. And that made me realize that there is not much that I can tell you that you don't already know. In fact, when we even when I interviewed Gareth Jones on uh, previous uh, episodes, um, he didn't tell us anything we didn't already know. But it was nevertheless great to get you know his perspective and insight. Um, and it did make me realize that you know a lot of the information is out there, and it's in such detail and in depth. A lot of you have asked me to get hold of, you know, Mark Ellis Flood and interview him. Um, it's been very difficult to track him down. Um, Gareth Jones did say it's very unlikely that Flood would want to give an interview because I think Flood, Mark Ellis, a, a lot like Gareth Jones, I think they've kind of said everything they're going to say about Depeche Mode. Um, but as you know, in the sort of free-flowing style of this channel, um, as Martin Gore once said, when you think you've tried every road, every avenue, take one more look at what you found old, and in it you'll find something new. So what I mean by that is, is although everything we're going to discuss in this channel, you've probably heard bef before or you know about it, hopefully me giving you my perspective and my feel and my just my general feeling on this will hopefully get you to see it in a different way, and by you interacting and leaving your comments, you will teach me something new regarding a subject that I know so well of myself. There is no sponsor for this video, but I do want to bring your attention to my Patreon channel. I want to thank all my Patreon members for your loyal support. And if you do join the Patreon channel for as little as two pounds a month for the opening tier, you will be able to see content like this in a little more detail. Uh, in fact, uh, a lot of the videos that we produce on YouTube, you will see them on Patreon, but with the addition of the original soundtracks in the background, which are great for sort of context. For example, out on Patreon next week, I will be doing a album walkthrough. Now, what that is, that is me listening to this record with headphones on in real time. So as I'm listening to it, I will be providing commentary to it you know, um, anything that comes to my mind. Um, and that can only be done on Patreon due to, uh, you know, copyright issues here on YouTube. So um, joining the Patreon community is not only a great way to support the channel, uh, it also is a great way for you to get additional content and also for you to be a part of, you know, secret live streams and Zoom chats. Please understand that the Patreon channel is not there to force you to join. You are not obliged at all. It is just there for those of you who would like a deeper level of content. And it is also a great way for you to support the channel and to ensure the longevity of this channel. But if you do not decide to join, just know that being here on YouTube, I am eternally grateful for your support. Right, so this episode we're going to focus on the sound and the production in free-flowing style. Now, when I talk about the sound of this record, um, many things come to mind. But let's run through the songs sort of in chronological order, and then I will just tell you what I mean. Bearing in mind that in later episodes we are going to do a separate episode for each song. This is going to go on for a while, guys. 
you wanted it, so here goes. Kicking off with World In My Eyes. World In My Eyes, the moment I heard it, I just thought, this is incredibly futuristic. It was like nothing I'd ever heard before. Just the way it starts, the, it's a very dry, open, minimalist sound. Just the dun 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 and the way the the notes move it's very unconventional there's not the, the progression is very from the left field Okay, now that sounds mad, but if you're a Depeche Mode fan, you know exactly what I mean. From the word go, just the way that first bass line comes in. It's very direct and it's very quirky at the same time. It's very dry. And then you've got that kind of, you know, on a sort of on, on a separate kind of beat to it. Uh, but it, it's kind of offset, so it gives it this can't even find the words for it and then i just love the way the the way the snare snare type sound it's not even a snare what the hell is that sound the way it comes in on the offbeat and then you've got the hi-hats very metronomic and um fast forward to the the melody that it's very weird it's a strange sound understand i will do a separate video on every song using some of the iconic sounds so just stay with me here the whole feel is so mad and even the let me take you on a trip around the world and back and you won't have to move you just sit still the that bendy sound and the and that snare and it's got on the snare it's got the it almost sounds like someone going into a microphone and it, you know, and then they layered that over a snare. I don't know how they did that. And in fact, you're going to hear me say that a lot on this album is how the hell did they make some of these sounds? It's a, it, it is an absolute head scratcher, but we're going to try my best to stay on topic here. World in my eyes, very, very futuristic. And I love it when it gets to the, that's all there is nothing more than you can feel now. The way Dave sings it, the baritone, that's all there is. And then Martin doing his part in the lighter head voice. That's all there is, nothing more than you can feel now. With a lot of, you know, sort of like vibrato. And Dave's been very sort of like anchored and, you know, rounded baritone. Um, but also, I love on the, the, the chord progression in that part. Tick, 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 tick. And you've got that sort of sustained note. I think it's played on the... The D sharp, tick, 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 tick. There is, there is so much going on there. And, I, and I, I mentioned this on the first video, is that this record sounds very minimalist. You know, there's not many parts to it. It's certainly not as um, part rich, or it's, it certainly doesn't sound as layered as, let's say, um, Black Celebration or Music for the Masses. You know, as far as pinpointing individual elements there are fewer elements to pinpoint but once you take that element and you you know from macro to micro and isolate it you will see there are so many nuances and and particular characteristics that make up that individual sound in fact i know so many friends and geeks that have tried to that have analyzed this record and tried to reverse engineer the sounds. And this is an absolute head scratcher. It is the record I keep, keep on, keep on coming back to. But yeah, um, there's a lot that I can say. Um, but World In My Eyes is a very futuristic sounding song. And in fact, this whole record is futuristic sounding. Um, it was futuristic sounding in 1990. And it is futuristic sounding now because it hasn't dated. There is nothing in this that you can point to and say, oh, that sounds dated. The older I get and the more I learn and understand about music and production, the higher this record goes up in my estimation. Um, it is mind boggling and I'm going to say that a lot. 
come on to the sweetest perfection. And once again, I've mentioned how this album flows. The the, the track listing and the order is just <laughs> perfect. Um, so the sweetest perfection, just the way it starts, the way uh, Wilder My Eyes fades out. I love the old fade out in songs. They don't seem to do that much these days, but fading out. A fade out in a song means et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It means carry on. Notice how fading out in songs is not a popular thing anymore. Songs tend to just end. Anyway, another story. The Swedish Perfection starts off with a and it always to me sounded, I don't know, when I was younger, it reminded me of a pressure steamer. My mom used to have this casserole dish with like a, what's this? Yeah, it had like this like a pressure cooker and remind me of that and, and it builds up and it just comes in with this boom 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 and the bass line to this it's it's really it's kind of sexy and sleazy it's boom 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 dun 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 and it hasn't it's low but uh, the top part of the bass sound has a real sort of like fm fm bass sound if you're a producer and a geek you'll know what i mean um but i like the way martin's voice comes in you know sort of right at the beginning you know once it wants the build up the sweetest perfection to call my own it's so intense it's so it's a little bit over the top but in in the in the most perfect way um I stop and I stare too much, afraid that I care too much. Um, this is a song about complete obsession, but we'll do a separate video on the, on the lyrics. Back to the sound. It just has this round boom, 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 boom. It, it has a, an intensity that draws you in. Um, and it's got really sort of like creepy sounds that are really like unsettling in the best possible way. Um, and once again, it's using sounds that I'm going, how the hell did you achieve that sound? I've mentioned this before, that if you take, you know, for instance, bands like Erasure or AHA, we're just getting random here now. When you listen to the sounds they use, and they are equally brilliant, I'm not comparing them. But if you listen to an AHA record, for example, you could point at something and go, yeah, that's a pad sound. It's a great sound, but I can tell that's a pad sound, or that's a, a piano-ish kind of sound, or, you know, the same with Erasure, you can go, that's a sequence type sound, or whatever. But with Depeche Mode, it's very difficult, because you'll go, okay, I know it's a synthesized, I know it's a synthesized sound, but but what, what is the starting point? You know, where, where did they start? Because because if, um, just jumping to um, the song Clean, there's this melodic part that goes, do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. And now you think, is that played on a piano, on a keyboard? But if you listen to the, the, the sound, the, the sort of the attack of the notes, uh, the attack is not quite there. The way it blends is kind of guitar-like, but I, 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 I can't really pinpoint it as a guitar sound. So there are many examples in this record where you're just going... What the hell is that sound? Um, just jumping to, there's the little musical interlude between the sweetest perfection and clean. You got that. It sounds like it sounds like atmospheric sounds. Um, but you listen to that and you go, what is that? It's beautiful. Of course, in the moment when you're losing yourself in it. You're not concerned with what the sounds are. And indeed, that is the way to listen to music. But when your rational production mind kicks in and you're going, what is the what is the basis of that sound? What is the starting point? In fact, there are so many sounds on this record that if you had to ask me to, you know, reverse engineer this or this this record or, you know, or to cover it, it would be very difficult because, you know, with the exception of you know, obvious obvious sounds like kick drums and and things like that and cymbals. There are a lot of individual elements in 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 this record where where the sound is so unusual that you don't even know what the starting point is. 
I think I've made my point there. Um, but the sweetest perfection as well. Also, when it gets to the end, it's got this so so touch. It's like it's got this like weird weird phasing reverse sound. Um, once again, um, the mixing by Francois Kavorkin was absolutely outstanding. I mean, I think everyone's done outstanding work in this. In fact, I think this record is a thorn in Martin's side. Every rose has its thorn. <laughs> now, the reason I say this record is a thorn in Martin's side is because I always talk about this period and the Songs of Faith and Devotion period being the point that they had reached a point that was so high that it was almost impossible to top it. I mean, this album is so critically acclaimed. You know, it launched them into the mainstream. Um, you know, that um, they just, I always talk about a grand synchronicity where all the parts come together and of course just going slightly off topic there was that incident where they did that record signing in america where they just expected a few you know 100 people to come to uh, a signing at a record store and of course it turned out to be there were thousands of people trying to get in there and you know i think the media exaggerated it and said it was a it was a like a you know like a riot and then i think uh, alan wilder said in an interview chelsea on a Sunday or on a Saturday, that's a right. This wasn't a right. But people did get hurt. And although the the media did uh, sort of exaggerate that story, I suppose, uh, Depeche Mode did talk about how when they went back to the hotel and they turned the, the TVs on, you know, that was all over the news. So, so everything and everything. And that was just one example of something that sort of happened at the right time. And that gave them tremendous international exposure, you know, just the you know, it, the fact that they were on every news station at the moment. And there are many, many examples as to, you know, where this is such a great example of all the parts coming together. Um, back to the sound of this, by the way. The Sweetest Perfection has a very, once again, the first time I heard it, I just thought this is so unusual. I have never heard anything like this in my life. And of course, I come back to this after having listened to, to it for years, for decades, really. And I still scratch my head you know, regarding what the starting point is for some sounds. And I marvel about the, the, um, everything about this album. Track three, Personal Jesus. Now this, as we know, was the first single they released in 1989. It became the biggest selling 12 inch in Warner, Warner, His, Warner Brothers, Warner Music history. Uh, even though they were quite skeptical when they put it out, they were just thinking, oh, no one's going to like it. Um, but, you know, it charted, it did everything. Personal Jesus was indeed a record that said, okay, here's Depeche Mode, but not in the way you've ever heard them before. And one of the most significant uh, parts of that record, not only the groundbreaking sound, was the guitar riff. That was the first time we sort of really heard a Depeche Mode song which was kind of guitar driven. I know they're, um, you know, in songs like Never Let Me Down Again, you've got that dun 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 And there are songs previously in the catalogue where there are guitar-like sounds or there are guitar strums. Let's not get into that. But this was the first time they released a song that was blatantly like Oh, that's a guitar. Wow. Um, I'm sure that when this first came out, people went, is that Depeche Mode? And the guitar is quite significant because the guitar did actually make quite a significant appearance on this record. Now, it's not, I suppose, Personal Jesus being the most sort of um, obvious example of it. You've got to remember that in songs like Policy of Truth, that guitar bend. Although when that's played live, that is uh, sampled into a synthesizer, uh, into a sampler, and they, they, you know, they hit a key, hit a key to play that, as I will demonstrate when I get to the songs. Um, but there are a lot of uh, guitar sounds in this, and indeed, um, there is a lot more of a sort of, I don't want to say rock, but a lot of the um, the sort of rhythms that we find creeping into this record are kind of rocky. Now, if if you look at Never Let Me Down Again from the previous album, Music for the Masses, you know, da, da, dum, dum, da, dun, da, dun, 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 dun
type vibe. I don't want to say sound, but it was more like a Rocky type vibe. I do think that Dave Bascombe was quite instrumental in that because remember he produced the Tears for Fears songs from the big chair. And that is why the song Shout, Shout, Let It All Out from Tears for Fears. When I heard it when I was a kid, I always thought that was the same artist. You know, if you listen to the way he goes, Shout, Let It All Out. That, that's the same. Uh, Roland Orzabal uses his voice in the same kind of way as uh, Dave Gahn does. You know, a sort of lower larynx uh, position, although it's a different voice. Another story. Um, we do find a sort of... a, 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 a quite a few rock elements creeping into this record, especially in, obviously, in Personal Jesus. Although the rhythm on Personal Jesus is not a sort of a rock rhythm, it's more of a stompy... And there's a mix online, which I will post the um, link to. Um, it was just groundbreaking. Once again, just the the way that mix starts, it was a you know one of the extended mixes mixed by uh, Francois Kavokan. Uh, you, you just hear the space. You know, it's, it's that space behind the, it, it, it's the space in between the sounds that gives it that. And you, you almost feel the air moving. It's, it's hard to explain, but you know what I mean? So although Personal Jesus had a rock kind of sound or vibe, uh, the rhythm was not very rocky. It was very, very stompy. Halo, which is the next track, that the rhythm to Halo is very rock-like. I want to say rock-like. Uh, yeah, don't want to insult. There's nothing rocky about Depeche Mode. Of course, they violated their rules when they did Songs of Faith and Devotion because they kind of, as Martin said, in Songs of Faith and Devotion, they kind of became the band that they were always reactionary to. You know, they became very rocky. Songs of Faith and Devotion was definitely rock and grunge influence, but there was nothing sort of cliche about it. But... That's not why you called. Back to Halo. Halo has got a kind of uh, rocky kind of rhythm. Um, and apparently, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the, 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 the rhythm, uh, the, the drum part is a sample from, uh, or elements of a sample from um, When the Levee Breaks. Now, remember in uh, Music for the Masses, they used the snare sound from When the Levee Breaks. And, and in this song halo they used uh you know rhythmic elements of that so you'll be surprised actually um and this is some from some very uh good sources i know in the industry i'm not going to go into that now but they've told me if you knew how much sampling was on this record you'd be surprised in fact there's a lot of sampling in this record there are a lot of sounds sampled from record string sounds and stuff stuff that i would have thought and you would have thought were kind of you know, generated from scratch. Uh -uh. They were actually sampled from other records. But remember, this was done in a time where, you know, music technology was definitely not, you know, as sophisticated as what it is today. To achieve this in 1990 would be a lot harder to do than these days. But as I always say, um, necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, I, I find that these days, because of all these conveniences we have, that sometimes makes us try a lot less harder. And this indeed was a period where you had to try a lot harder. And my God, what a record. Have I said that before? Sorry, I'll say it again. I'll say it again. The sound of Halo, obviously very futuristic. Once again, when I heard it the first time, I was just like, oh my God, I've never heard anything like this. I just love that lead sound. Da 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 Dun, 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 dun. It's very machine like. It's not melodic. It's just dun, 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 dun. and it's very brutal. And the way the sound pans, you know, you know, through the through the uh, the, the sound spectrum, you know, the from left to right and back and forth. It's amazing. Once again, I will demonstrate all these songs in detail when I break them down. Remember, one song per episode. We're going to go completely down the rabbit hole. We then get on to after Halo. Waiting for the Night. Now, Waiting for the Night is a beautiful, beautiful, once again, how do you define it? It's kind of like, it's kind of like a lullaby. It's got that little, dun, 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 dun. there is a star in the sky. This is the most stripped back song on the album. And it really allows 
Martin and Dave's voices to really take, you know, the, the center stage. And the harmonies on this are beautiful. I believe the bass, uh, or the sort of sequence for this was using um, Flood's ARP 2600. Um, but that's all just gear and geeky stuff. Also, what's lovely about this record is if you... Um, if you're listening on headphones, put the headphones on, okay? Here's your ex exercise for today. Put the headphones on and then pull one of the cans off and listen how the bass line goes doom 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 and on the and on the other side, take this side off, put this side on. Uh, it, the the bass line goes doo 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 The the bass line uh, just see what I mean. Listen to the song with one ear open and then do it the other way and you'll notice how the bass line is so well sequenced um okay if you if you drop it into mono you won't get that effect but the stereo effect on this just how the bass line you know is panning from left to right and and working uh, it's like in the left ear it, it's kind of like i don't know if it's playing in triplets i haven't checked it out yet you know, i haven't analyzed it but it's Doom 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 doom, and on the right hand ear it's doo -doo 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 -doo. it's kind of like a secret. So it's, you, you've got these two separate rhythms kind of playing off each other, and it's it's it, it's absolutely mind blowing. I'm waiting for the night to fall. The sound of waiting for the night is very futuristic, but it has kind of like a a tender familiarity about it. You know, it's that real sort of like it's, I think it's like the comfort of a lullaby. And I just love the the way Martin carries it out. Um, yeah, we'll go into a lot of detail when we do the song by song analysis. Once again, talking as an album flow, as as it ends, and then enjoy the silent start. It's it's such a you know because by the end of waiting for the night, you're in such a trance, and then the way. Enjoy the Silence comes on, it, it really changes tone. And it, it Enjoy the Silence is a a a once again a, a a masterpiece. It's it's a melancholic, upbeat, moody, hopeful, anthemic song. Um amazing how many different moods they could fit into one song. And Enjoy the Silence is is that type of song. In fact, Enjoy the Silence is a textbook, absolute textbook example of how um, you take a demo and you turn it into something else. And remember that Martin used to always present demos in a very complete form. As I said in the previous video, listen to the, the demo of Shake the Disease. Although the demo does not sound as sonically brilliant as the, the, the complete you know the the finished product the the actual all the elements in the musical parts are there and the brief the, the the instructions that martin was given before they did this record was martin when you come to the studio next time with your demos can you just bring something very sparse and very just we, we basically just want you to give us the idea but we don't want you to present something that is so complete that there's no room for us to add you know to contribute to but and that's exactly what they did and i said this in the previous video and check it out again check out the demo of um enjoy the silence and you will just hear that how far it has come you know using this and also the um the enjoy the silence has been their pro probably their biggest seller a uh, biggest selling track to date because it has a very sort of it's kind of got a like a kind of a dancey kind of feel to it it has it has like a disco beat in fact, uh, I don't know if this is true, but apparently that was sampled from a disco record. I'm not sure, but that is what I've been told by many sources. And once again, I've been told by many credible sources that there is a lot of sampling on here. In fact, a lot more than you would have thought of. And and it's you know it's not that every sound was generated from scratch, but this is. As a body of work, you know, it doesn't matter how you achieve the end result. This as a body of work is a masterpiece. And, you know, as a producer, um, the way I see it is it is it, the perfect combination between technology, um, found sounds, generated sounds, you know, slightly rocky, techno-ish, um, dreamy, uh, anthemic, sad, moody, edgy. 
and the the way the synthesized or the generated sounds blend with the found sounds and and how they in turn blend with the you know the the sampled sounds you know and, and the way it's mixed it's the way everything sits in its space but it's still as its own entity it's a complete whole man this is a masterpiece have i said that before Coming back to the guitars again, the guitar sound is very significant in this record and one of one of the few songs which they'd done up until that point where the guitar was so um, important. And this comes back to, if you've watched the documentaries, which I'm sure you have, was when they had the chat with Flood before doing this record. And I think, as Fletch said, we you know we told Flood we've got this philosophy of never use the same sound twice, and you know generate every sound from scratch. And and Flood really just basically said in his own way that your preconceived ideas are crap. You know, just throw that all out the window, and use what works. Because if if you know that a guitar is going to work, just use the bloody guitar. And I think it was Flood that's that said. When he first heard Martin Gore play the guitar, he was like amazed at what a good guitarist Martin was. Because he would, and 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 I also think this is where Flood was very important because if Martin, remember Martin started off at thirteen years old playing guitar. That is that was his first instrument. So by the time this record came out, he would have been in his what late twenties, early thirties. So he he had obviously as a guitar being his first instrument, he'd obviously mastered it, uh, you know. And so for him not to include that in the records was a was a very strange thing to do. So I think with Martin kind of picking up a guitar and Flood just going, hang on, yeah, man. <laughs> you know? It's like not singing when you've got the best voice in the world. Um, Martin, you can play the guitar, just put this in. And coming back to Enjoy the Silence, we all know the story. Uh, it's been well documented how, you know, Alan and Flood worked on this. They thought, well, let's let's up up it. You know, let's let's take Martin's demo, which was fundamentally a harmonium and a voice. So Alan and Flood decided to be really left field with this. They were probably thinking, okay, we're in the studio, yeah, and you know, Fletch and Martin and Dave are out there having a drink. Well, this demo sounds the way it does. How about if we add a disco beat to it? <laughs> Martin's going to hate that, but let's do it. And you know, they. Put the disco beat in and it's the, the BPM of this song is 113 BPM. Um, once again, I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe that the, the, the beat the and the kick was sampled from a disco record. I'm not sure about that, but I've heard that from a lot of people. And then, of course, when Martin came in and they said, well, what do you think, Martin? <laughs> I don't like that. <laughs> Martin wasn't happy. And I think this was the sort of early stage of the sort of conflict that was sort of arising. I don't say conflict, but this was probably the start of the sort of real um, disagreements with, you know, Alan and Martin. This was probably the point where Martin was probably thinking, hey, cut, hey, you're muscling in on my parade. Yeah. I don't know, but I just get the feeling because I know that by the time we got to Songs of Faith and Devotion, um, Flood does talk about how when they were mixing the last song on the last day, that um, as he was mixing, Alan and Martin were sitting behind him and they were literally shouting at each other. So I think there was always a conflict of interest because Martin, as the songwriter, will have a sort of clear idea of where he's going. But then following Alan's brief where Alan said, OK, bring the songs in, just give us the idea. Don't, you know, don't over sketch them out. And that obviously gave um, Alan free reign to kind of have his input. But of course, you can understand how that would cause a lot of friction. Um, and then we know the story how Martin, I believe he first went up to a keyboard and just came up with a melody, the actual melody to enjoy the silence. And then, you know, once he'd played that melody, he picked up guitar and he, you know, he played that melody in and they were like, wow. And then I think, and I've seen this as so many times as a producer myself, when you're producing someone, um, you lay something down and then you go oh this is good let's make it better and better and better and then after going full circle you eventually come back to it and go well it sounded good the, you know the first time round and that was indeed the case with enjoy the silence you know when martin picked up that guitar and played that riff i think it was done in 
maybe the first or the second or the third take. And that was just kind of like the guide riff. And then they tried to do it better and better and better. And then, I don't know, by the time they'd come full circle, they decided that the first take or the, you know, one of the first takes he had done was the best. And that was indeed the take, the take that made it onto this record. And there are so many iconic parts to this song. Um, once again, I suppose this is the most sort of commercial sounding song on the record because it did sort of stick its head out into the commercial market. And indeed, if I can just use a random example, my mum likes that song, okay? My mum can't stand Depeche Mode. She thinks she, she just thinks it's really depressing, as a lot of people do. But she likes that song. And I think Enjoy the Silence is the song that you can kind of play in, in commercial fields because, you know, it's 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 got a familiar type of sound to it. And that doesn't mean it's any less brilliant. But as a lot of the fans here will often say, if you ask someone, uh, you know, what's your favorite Depeche Mode song? And they say, enjoy the silence. Then you think to yourself, they're probably not a fan, are they? Because, <laughs> you know, if you're a fan, you will think of something a lot more obscure. But yeah, enjoy the silence did what it did. It it, it really, um, it was the highest charting uh, track for them in the UK here. Um, you know, they were never off to chart positions and stuff. But this record is, uh, the Enjoy the Silence is, as I say, it's it's a melancholic track. And if you listen to Martin's demo and, and to where, you know, it was taken by Flood and and Wilder, you can just hear the brilliance of that Wilder-Flood collaboration. The chords in this are lovely. And I also like that. It's very, very melodic. Um... And I, of course, the the guitar riff, but I do love the 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 choir voice, the ha. Ah, mm, excuse me, uh, that is Martin's voice, which he went ah, and they sampled it into a, a keyboard and probably layered it with some choir type sounds. Or um, I don't know how they've done it, guys, but um, it sounds fucking amazing. Enjoy the silence fades out, and then we get the enjoy the silence. And then you've got that really moody interlude. And then they go, the set point. What are they saying? The set point. No idea. Comments below. Uh, but I love it. Um, and just the way, and, and then it's got this kind of like bagpipe sound. And then it sounds like a something's being reversed. I don't know what the starting points are for many of these sounds. And then it kind of blends. And then just the way policy, policy of truth comes in. And it's got kind of like a, it's got this kind of like, like you know those dogs you have in the back of a car and they go dun, 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 dun. <laughs> probably not the best example but it has what i'm trying to illustrate is if, if you take enjoy the silence how it's there's this beautiful upbeat melancholic moody ballad love song masterpiece and then it just enjoy the silence you've got that then you've got that musical part. And in that part, it sounds like an elastic. Reminds you of an elastic. What the hell? And just the way policy of true stars. Once again, it's a change of tone. And then... Now we know that the it's a, it's a guitar sa sample, but the keyboard sound um, layered. Um, I don't know what the starting point was. You had something to hide. You should have hidden it, shouldn't you? Once again, we'll talk about the lyrics and the structure in later videos. If we start back in Wild in My Eyes, remember Wild in My Eyes is more like a -bum 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 -bum, quirky kind of futuristic um, Swedish perfection. Dum -dum -dum. I wouldn't even know what to put that in. Um, personal Jesus, rocky sounding, but with like a stompy kind of beat. Very, very futuristic. Halo, once again, a more rocky type rhythm. Waiting for the night, a beautiful, bittersweet, dark 
ethereal ballad. Enjoy the silence. A ballad with a disco beat. No wonder Martin just hated the idea. And policy of truth. Industrial sounding, modern, but with a rock, rock kind of rhythm. A similar rhythm to Never Let Me Down Again. Da, 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 da. Uh, once again, the drums sound of this very rock kind of sounding, not entirely authentically rock. Um, remember, there were rock elements, but there was nothing cliche rock about this. But the rock sort of rhythm in Policy of Truth is very obvious. It's just time to pay the price. And I love the sounds they use in there in this song, obviously. It has these kind of like bagpipe type sounds, although it's not a bagpipe sound, it could be, but there it has a bagpipe type quality to it. In fact, it's a very similar type of sound to a sound they use in um, A Question of Time. So it, it is some type of string, but I don't know what they do to it to get it to do that sound, but it's very, very Depeche Mode. Um, they use a lot of feedback in this song, especially towards the end. It's got, there's a lot of sort of like guitar distortion and things, especially when it gets to the never again is what you swore the time before. It's got this real sort of like crunchy, gritty, edgy guitar sounds. And of course, right at the end, it goes. Dum -bow, dum -bow, bow. It is just a bizarre way of bizarre is probably an insulting. I don't, I don't, it's, no, it's not the word, but it's just a really off the wall, out the box way of doing things. Um, you know, I often hear records which are experimental and you go, OK, like you sometimes you just go, OK, you've lost me. It's, it's just too far off the wall. This record. Uh, Retained your interest because you retain my interest. You're the only one. <laughs> this record retains your interest. Um, it has just the right amount of innovation necessary to keep everything kind of gelled together and to keep it interesting without kind of going off the wall. There's nothing about this record which kind of goes off in a tangent. Um, they have done that recently with certain songs, and I don't want to get into that now. But this record is very, very experimental. But at the same time, th there's a familiarity to it. There is nothing annoying or... Um... <sighs> I'll just stop there. Let's move on to the next song. Okay, so Policy of Truth ends. And then Blue Dress. <laughs> Once again, put that on headphones and then just... You know, listen with this ear on, this ear off, and then swap it around. And then notice how the bass line is, 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 is played. You know, there are different parts playing off each other. The rhythm to New Dress is a, it's a waltz. It's one, two, three, 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 bum, bada, bum, bum, bada, bum, bum, bada, bum, 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 bada, bum, bum, bada, bum, bum, bada, bum, 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 put it on. It's one, two, three, one, two, three. It's, it's a waltz. You would just think, oh, it's, it's a waltz, yes. Um, and once again, the the bass lines, bum 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 bum, and on the other side is like bum bara bum bara bum bum bara bum, a combination of triplets and I think straights and yeah, um, I, I I would need to analyze it a bit more, but uh, uh, a masterpiece. The I love that, and they go. Put it on and don't say a word. Put it on. I love this song. This is one of my favorite Martin Gore songs. Um, I know there's some people who don't really like this song, uh, but this to me is, it'll have a soft spot in my heart. I mean, I'm not having anything bad said about Violator. Um, once again, when you get to, because when you learn, you'll know what makes the world so, you know, there's no guitar in until that point, but just in that, in those little breaks. Because when you run, you know rock makes a rotten. And I love it when we get to say you believe. 
dum 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 you've got these piano chords dum dum bum like sort of like low dark piano chords which is very typical in wilder's type production he uses that a lot in in his recoil stuff once again this song if i was to define a style of it, it it's it's kind of like it's also like a lullaby it's like a lullaby in a waltz timing um but it's just so tender and and yeah the lyrics which we'll go into later I think it's Martin thinking, okay, he, he, he's just watching this girl. She's naked and she's putting on a dress. And Martin, you kinky bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you, he's watching a girl put on a, a, a dress and he's just thinking, this is what makes the world turn. It's, it's appreciating simplicity and, yeah, and living in the moment and just thinking, this is what makes the world turn. But we'll get into that when we go down the, the lyrics rabbit hole. We're going to dive deeply into that. Because once again, there is so much. Uh, 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 there's, uh, there are so many meanings to these songs and so many different interpretations which different people have. Now, I love the way Blue Dress fades out. And this is that strange little musical interlude which joins into Clean. It's like, what are those sounds? It sounds like ducks, and but they sound like ducks to me. Um, but you know, I I always envision like a, like a swamp, no, not no, not like a filthy swamp, but it, you know, it's it's hard it's hard to explain what I see with this, but I, I see something, and this record takes me it really takes me away. I do love that part before clean that. It's just so sad. Difficult to define what I feel sometimes. But then the way that, oh, they've got the voices going, oh, it's very emotional. Yes. Then, dum, 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 clean. Don't get me started with clean. The music video to Clean is just Martin kissing a girl. <laughs> I can just imagine when that music video was made. Anton went, Martin, you have to come here. Uh, you have to go on and kiss the girl. Uh, I've got to kiss a girl. Yeah, you've got to kiss the girl. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> Clean is a song which a lot of people will rate as um, one of their favorite Depeche Mode songs. It's also a song that a lot of people will rate as a song that, you know, is very um, up there, but doesn't necessarily get the recognition that it deserves from, you know, the Depeche Mode community. Clean, the cleanest I've been. And I just love the dum, dum, da, dum, dum. There's something really primal about this. So you've got like this kind of primal beat, but you've got this. So this this song to me is very primal. This is this is the song that is the most primal, um, but it has this real technological sign. It's almost like a civilization from you know millions of light years in the future goes back in our time and joins up with cavemen. You have that brutality of the cave, that, that rawness of like ethnic music. And you have the sophistication, um, but then you also have the heart and the emotion that goes with this. And one thing I want to point out as well on this record is the, not only the great mastering and the sound of it, but it just breathes. It wasn't overly crunched or you know, in the mastering stage, you know, it, I suppose it's in those days, It you know, although artists have always tried to make their records louder than others, this record was just the finished product. It is just so dynamic. It doesn't sound over processed or crunched or bottlenecked. It just really, really breathes. And I just want to quickly show you what I mean in this example. Right. So I just want to use this as a sort of brief demonstration just to sort of show you um, how great the dynamic range was on, you know, on Violator. Now, I don't want to get sucked down a rabbit hole because this could become a whole subject by itself. 
And as I'm sitting here, I'm thinking this will be a great subject for a future video where we can sort of compare the uh, the mastering of the various different albums. But just for the purpose of this video, I just want to sort of show you. I'm using two extreme examples here. Um, at the bottom here, I've got Enjoy the Silence. Um, this is from um, a digital purchase from line, online. And this is a song, A Pain That I'm Used To from Playing the Angel. And this is also bought from a, yeah, an online store. And the reason I bought them from the same online store is just really to, uh, you know, I want them to have equal footing. Now, if I was to import the um, the audio file for the for the vinyl, um, I could assure you there would be probably even more dynamic range. Um, another discussion. But anyway, I just want to sort of use two extreme examples here just to show you. Um, the, uh, the the sort of amount the, the amount of dynamic range the difference between let's say something like enjoy the silence and a pain that I'm used to now that is probably an unfair comparison uh, but the reason I'm doing this is just to illustrate a point um, you know enjoy the silence came out in 1990 um, and then if we compare it to a pain that I'm used to um, that album came out in 2007 2006 2007 and that was in the sort of peak of the loudness wars and um that was the time where you know they would they would really over limit and really push the they just push everything into the red in an attempt to get more volume out of, of a song um but i mean as you can see here on the bottom we've got enjoy the silence just look at the dynamic range of course um if you don't understand what that means basically the dynamic range is the difference between the the lowest peaks and the highest peaks and what you can see here is uh, on enjoy the silence just just how it breathes you know there's so much space and a pain that I'm used to just look at it it's just kind of like it's almost just like a block it's especially apparent when we get to the loudest part of the songs um, if we're on enjoy the silence now I should think this is probably around about where the chorus kicks in all I ever wanted all I ever needed can you see there's still a lot of dynamic range but whereas a pain that I'm used to just look at it it's, it's there are no sort of peaks and troughs it's just kind of it's just like a solid block look it's just like maxed out and it's it's kind of cut off on the top there. Look, look at enjoy the silence. Just, just look at look at the difference between the the highest peaks and the lowest. You know, there, there is such a dynamic range. But look, look at a pain that I'm used to. It's just, it's just like a solid block. It's just out, out, outrageously maxed out. Um, you guys know that I do actually like a pain that I'm used to, and the in fact I'm a big fan of the um, playing the the angel album. Um, I have heard it on vinyl and it sounds a lot better because obviously on um, you know mastering you can be a, you can be a lot more aggressive when mastering digitally. I've got some hidden tracks here so if I just pull those up um, just to you know provide some context here here's another song here track four uh, the sinner in me from the playing the angel album as you can see as well once again you know when we get to the loudest parts now it's not as bad as a pain that I'm used to but it, you know it's kind of it's kind of up there. If you take something like uh, The Sweetest Perfection from Depeche Mode, which is this track here, can can you see how, how much dynamic range there is? It's just so much, it just breathes so much more. Um, I also just wanted to show Barrel of a Gun. Uh, yeah, um, that's this one here, uh, number five. Uh, w w once again, also kind of chopped off at the top, you know. Um, and I think Alan Wilder did complain about the the mastering on that, on, on some of those records just being brutally brutally loud um i just wanted to also for reference um just show you um depeche modes uh going backwards from their latest spirit album and you can actually see here that's the, the bottom one here how the dynamic range is a lot better than sort of um you know songs of that sort of mid uh you know two th you know bet between sort of like early 2000 and 2007 uh, you know it's just where they really used to limit the crap out of the stuff um and and that is down to mastering these days um you don't need to master as loud as what you did back in those days as i say i don't want to go down a rabbit hole um but it's really it's just to in layman's terms just show you the you know the ext the, the the extremity of some of the mastering in, in earlier record you know in sort of uh at a certain period but if I can just get you to focus on this one here the enjoy the silence one just notice how how dynamic that is you know it's not maxed out it's not you know 
once again, the, the difference between the highs and the lows is quite dramatic uh, or, or dynamic. It's not it's not like pain that I'm used to where it's literally just slammed, slammed. Um, so yeah, I think this this would be a great idea for a future video. But um, I'm just trying to highlight here how brilliantly dynamic um, "Enjoy the Silence" was. Um, and indeed, as I said, if I imported the vinyl, we would probably see uh, even more dynamic range, probably slightly more. Um, in fact, that would be a good comparison for a future video. Anyway, let's get out of here. So the sound of this record, absolutely phenomenal. And as I said, I'm sure this record is a hard one to beat. Uh, it must be the one when Martin's writing a song, people will be like, oh, Martin, yeah, something like Violator, please. Something like Violator. Because even in the documentaries that I've watched, you know, everyone from their publicist to their stage manager to like Andy Franks and, uh, you know, Daryl Bermonte and, you know, their, their publicist and all of them, their booking agents, all said that Violator is their favorite album. And I suppose it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a tough nut to crack what they achieved with this is th this is mastery this is this is what few artists will ever manage to achieve and 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 they did it and even if you only do it once <laughs> you know as salvador dali said well forget perfection you'll never get there and um, but yeah i think t as far as i'm concerned in my mind and to my ears this is as close as you can come to to sonic perfection <laughs> it really is call me a fanboy Right, my friends, this has been a long video and uh, yeah, very, very emotionally uh, d described, I suppose. If you were expecting something really technical, understand that um, it is very difficult for me to, when I'm talking about a sound of something, it is ver very difficult for me not to include the emotion attached to that because the sound and the production of something evokes a feeling to me and I just think that is important. I cannot sort of like detach and just talk coldly and mechanically and technically about something without bringing the emotions that it evokes within me. Anyway, I want to hear from you now, my friends. Let me know in the comments below anything you want to say about Violator, the sound, the production. I'm sure you've got a lot to say. Um, once again, let me know in the comments if there's anything you'd like me to elaborate on. Remember, the series is going to be very in-depth. We're going to go down the rabbit hole and we're not going to leave any stone unturned. Thank you so much, my friends. Hit that subscribe button. Um, thank you so much for your support. Um, I will see you on the next video. Thank you to my patrons. There's some great content coming out there in the patron community. And to all of you, thank you so much. Be safe, lots of love, and I'll see you on part three of the Violator album review series when it continues next week. Take care, my friends. Adios.